Everyone, welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight for this next event in conjunction with uh, Northern Clay Center's latest exhibition, The Secret Life of Objects. My name is Sam Longley. I'm the Education Coordinator at NCC, and I've had the awesome job of getting to work with the artists and the curators of this show uh, to form these related educational events. So um, first, I just want to welcome you all. Um, from all corners of the country tonight. Uh, and I'll start by respectfully acknowledging that Northern Clay Center is located on Dakota land. Uh, this event is also made possible by, uh, in part by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota State Arts Board Operating Support Grant, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. In the Secret Life of Objects, our curators, Patty Chalmers and Jill Foot Hutton, bring together artists who imagine the life of a ceramic object beyond the pedestal through drawing, collage, and film. The Secret Life of Objects shares the most compelling clay work crossing material boundaries and draws in new audiences to engage in the role of voyeuristic observer. Artists in the exhibition include Natalia Ar Arbelez, Ste Stephen Bird, <laughs> Arthur Gonzalez, Valerie Ling, Leslie Macklin, and Anu Laura Tuttleberg. The Secret Life of Objects is now on view at Northern Clay Center. And if you're not able to visit us in person, we do have a virtual 3D tour um, along with the accompanying videos in the, in the exhibition uh, available to view and tour on our website. And I'll sneak that link in the chat so you can see it if you have not yet. Uh, so tonight we're joined by artist Valerie Ling. And before I hand it over to Valerie for her talk, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about her and her work. Uh, Valerie Ling explores the divide between how reality is viewed and experienced through a child's perception and the evolution of experience as one moves into adulthood. That journey sees the ebb of imagination and innocence and the introduction of pragmatism and societal influence. Her work projects the realism of adult issues through a lens of pure and lighthearted childlike insight. Ling earned her BFA from at New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 2015 and was also a recipient of the Anonymous Artist Studio Fellowship at Northern Clay Center in 2016. Tonight we'll, we will venture into the world that, Ling, that Ling's objects live in and discover how her world of objects is shaped by stylization, stories, and recurring themes as she shares about her process and formation of ideas. We'll have some Q&A for uh, Q&A time at the end of the talk, and we ask that you remain on mute until that time, uh, or feel free to type your questions in the chat when they come up. Uh, so without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Valerie. So hello everyone. Thank you um, for joining me today for this talk. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share my work with everyone. Um, I'd like to also thank you all for your support and your interest. And also a big thank you to the Northern Clay Center for giving me this opportunity to um, share my work with you guys. So my name is Valerie Ling and um, my work right now consists of mainly um, figures of children, uh, mostly of um, little girls and like how they interact with whatever kind of um, environment I put them in and like with interacting with different objects that I like add to them being it being like flowers or um, it could be like, I don't know, like a random bird or something, just like different things that um, I'll like add to their stories. Um, but it kind of took me a good amount of time until I was able to kind of be consistent with um, visually how my pieces looked, um, a style that I really enjoyed to kind of pursue and um, just a consistent set of like meanings and themes that I wanted to share in my work. So in this talk, like I'll just kind of be going through um, the whole journey that I took in order to get from the work that I did back then to um, finding the stories that I relate to and like want to share with people. Um, so let's get started. So 
I wanted to start with this piece um, titled I Am um, because it was really the first um, piece that I really focused on the human figure. I always had an interest in um, working with like the body and um, figurative um, pieces in, in my artwork. But it was really this piece that I made um, in college during my junior year um, that kind of propelled, like it planted the seeds to all the concepts that I now kind of focus on in my art. And in this class, it was with uh, Wayne Higby. And I remember the very beginning, the first day of the sculpture, ceramic sculpture class, he had given us these notebooks and told us just to write down, notice what you notice and just base your whole entire year um, or whole entire semester with him making things that we notice. And at the time, um, like prior to this class and hearing this quote and exploring with Wayne, I was kind of still struggling with what I wanted to make in ceramics. Like I love ceramics, but all the classes that I'd taken before then and the projects that I was assigned, I never was fully interested in. Like I couldn't like throw myself in like my peers to kind of transform it into something that was really my own. Um, but after hearing this quote and like spending some time in his class, I was really able to kind of start to find that voice. And this piece here um, was more or less a self portrait of myself. Um, I, had at the same time kind of like sat in class demos with Ashley Lyon who specializes in figures um, and I would like watch her demos on how the, she built the human body and I thought that I would like to make a piece on the things that I identified with um, at that time and like kind of mold the upper part of that that body with those things so I literally took objects that I had in my bag that kind of like told other people that, yeah, that's foul stuff. That's what she has with her at all times. So it's just things that I identified with, such as like, um, I had like my watch. I made bisque molds of my watch that I always had. I had my cell phone. I, it was just like little things too. It wasn't even specific things that related to myself very generic, very um, uh, kind of relatable to everyone too. But just because I said this was me, that's what it became. Um, I had bottle cap for my water bottle. Um, and I don't know if you can see these clearly, but these more bulbous forms that pop up throughout the entire piece, they were actually um, bis molds of baby heads. I had these <laughs> baby head keychains that were lining the entirety of my my backpack that I carried with me at all times so I had that thing and like even f like you can see an imprint of a fork here there's imprints of spoons that I was always eating wherever I went so I had my utensils with me at all times so it's just like these small little minute unimportant things kind of like all built up together to make um this portrait of myself and I was really interested in the idea of like identity and stuff at the time. So moving on, um, the next project, I wanted to kind of explore that idea even further, but kind of focus my shift, uh, kind of shift my focus on not just like physical things and like material things that I had, but what I kind of refer to as the material world of my mind. And so I um, pick and chose like things that I obsessed with at the time, things that um, I like to draw, things that just popped into my head for no reason. And one of them was this giraffe bird, this um, creature with a long neck and body like a giraffe spotted sometimes, sometimes they have stripes, sometimes they have a whole different other pattern. Um, but then it also had this like bird beak like nose um, and a simple, simple name giraffe bird. And this image kind of like overtook 
the rest of my junior year um, at college. And I made this big piece that kind of encompassed this whole idea of um, obsession over certain things that which led me to kind of link that fixation to childish behaviors and being lost in your own world. Um, and that piece is this one right here. And so from there's a very kind of like big visual difference between the first piece and this piece being like the styles are kind of completely changed. The first one was abstract, but like still kind of realistic from like the, the human form and everything. But then to this one, everything is more colorful. It's almost like cartoonish. The figure itself isn't, it's like I backtracked in time. The, the limbs are just like, like noodly shaped things. There's no real detail to like the, the joints or anything. It's very voluminous. Um, and yeah, I really wanted to kind of show that side of my mind in comparison to the other and like kind of have that shift. Um, I also, in this piece, it's the first one that I start to do like no eyes in my figures which I think at the time, um, it was more of just like a stylistic choice. Um, I didn't really assign it any meaning yet. Um, yeah. And then from that piece on, um, I figured like it was getting close to my senior year. I had to figure out what I was going to make for my um, BFA show. And one of my most favorite quotes ever was this quote from Willy Wonka. And it's just come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. And just the idea of being able to like create a world that people can go into like um, and kind of like understand the my, like how my mind worked was really, really, really um, attractive to me. So I spent the main focus of my senior year trying to create this world and like through my pieces. Um, and one of the pieces was this one called Stefan or Jelly Beans. And it's one of my most famous um, favorite pieces. It um, has so many different like layers of absurdity and story and um, also like elements that I have now slowly evolved into like recurring motifs and stuff in my work. Um, so this is kind of like the, the rough draft of it all. I have my flowers, I have the girl, I have um, the, these red shoes that I now make. Um, like right here, you can have a better view. And in this piece, this girl is chilling on duck but also before the duck, it's this weird blob that she's sitting on, almost looks like a giant wad of gum. Like, I don't really know what it is. Um, but in her hand is this giant pile of jelly beans. And she's kind of like lost in her own thoughts. She just like preoccupied with like eating these jelly beans, licking these jelly beans, like the jelly beans are her world. She doesn't probably, she probably doesn't even know that she's sitting on a duck with flowers on its head and like Buddha textured hair, like who knows. Um, and this piece, half of it was for my mind, um, just like, I was also obsessed with ducks, um, besides the giraffe bird. So the first thing I knew when I was sketching out this piece was I need to put a giant duck in it. And then ideas kind of piled up and morphed into this. But the other half of it was, um, that I took a story from one of my closest friends at college, Steph, and she had told me over the summer that she'd become obsessed with jelly beans. Like she would go through canisters, like so many, like wholesale size, Costco size um, boxes of jelly beans. Her, I think her family included, they were just in this jelly bean phase. And I thought it was such a great story and fitting for my whole idea of like fixation and, um, 
almost like this childish um, love for candy that I guess never really disappears. But like when you refer or like link children to candy, it's uh, at least personally, I get a stronger bond with children and candy than when we grow up as adults and we still like candy. Yeah, we still like candy, but I think the attraction or obsession is not the same. So I love that story and I incorporate it into this. And um, I think that was the first, this was the first next step to my work where um, it's this um, like collaging of exterior or like community stories um, or like a communal narrative that I apply to my work. Um, and then another piece in my show that influences a lot to my um, later pieces is this one, the lollipop. And in this one, I focused a little bit more on the girl. It was less about the environment she was in. Um, really, she's just sitting on this chair with uh, flowers on the back. And I think at this time too, the flowers were more of a um, just like a visual choice. I, I liked flowers. I liked um, just having them there, but I didn't pay too much attention or like give them too much meaning as I do now in my pieces. Um, but yeah, in this one, the focus on the girl is the, main, the key thing. As I was developing her, I had a lot of references um, that I was looking at specifically um, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini and um, the paintings of young girls by Baltus and how in both paintings and sculptures, the female figure is kind of like lost in their own world. It's like this otherworldly, um, like euphoria that they're in, especially in the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And, but then in Balthus, like these girls are in these kind of suggestive positions, um, but of course not to them because they're still so young and innocent that they're really just sitting in ways that they're comfortable with. Um, and I really liked that idea to play with. So I made her doing what like every kid would do like sitting on maybe their favorite chair at home or something and just enjoying a lollipop with their stuffed animal, which in this case is also another duck, but kind of more monster-like. Um, but yeah, this one explored more of the kind of, not necessarily darker side to um, childhood and like kind of this obliviousness that they have to their surroundings. Um, where they might not um, like pay too much attention to societal um, societal uh, like boundaries, rules, um, things that are inappropriate versus appropriate. Um, yeah, so with this piece, I started to kind of shift the the meaning and and my statement a little bit. Um, it was more than on kind of the childhood world versus the adult world and how they kind of like mishmash together and like the, the conversation that they can have. So a children, child looking at this might say that, yeah, that's like me. That's, there's nothing wrong with this at all. But then an adult looking at this might think otherwise, where it's like, why, why she's sitting so suggestively? Like we can still we can see her bloomers, her leg is up. Why is she licking the lollipop like that? Um, I wanted these kind of questions to like pop into the viewer's mind as they engaged in, in, with my work. Um, and then moving on after creating all these pieces for my um, BFA show. I moved to Minneapolis for a year because I was accepted into their residency 
program for the anonymous artist. And one of the best things that I always like enjoyed to do when I was there was to visit the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, I went there like numerous times, I can't even count. Um, and I had taken a lot of art history classes throughout college with like almost an interest or focus on East Asian ceramics and arts. Um, and this piece or pieces that I was really interested in, interested in were these Tang Dynasty fat ladies, but um, didn't know that when I would get to this museum that they would actually have one of those pieces there. So the picture in the middle was one that I actually took myself. Um, I was like ecstatic to see it in person. Um, and it really struck me like how kind of similar they were. Like I never really noticed or like kind of linked the, the visuals to my own work with of course like the Asian, like the black hair, we're very like bulbous, um, very voluminous. Um, and these, the rosiness of their cheeks or like the pops of red that I started becoming interested in they were so synonymous with each other. And I became like really interested in that. And so I started exploring um, different ways of creating my girls and like making the changes necessary to kind of convey the meanings that I wanted now to with a more limited palette of color and like focuses on like pops of this bright like rosy cheek red in certain areas um and one of the pieces I made was this one the hole and in this piece um there's so much of like a color difference compared to the ones that I had made previously in in my BFA show like I really focused on like meaning of color and like where to like assign color. Um, most of the times now the figures were completely white to just to symbolize like still the innocence of children and um, how like untainted they are and stuff. And then I, I still used the bunch of red like in certain areas, but now a little bit more like I thought harder about it before I, I put the red down. Um, I still kept the same like Mary Jane shoes. I think that's definitely a recurring motif like that's now in my work. Um, just the idea of these shoes, it's so, I think if you just see them in a store, like they exude like childhood of a girl. Like I think every girl when they were young wore these um and it's even harder now to find shoes that look like this when you're adults and even when you do people question it and like just kind of link it back to childhood like there's a lot of fashion in Japan where people dress up as like very like frilly with like pastel colored outfits and stuff and they all have these shoes but because they're it's very doll like people assume that they're trying to kind of go back into childhood and dress like that. So there, I think there's a very heavy meaning with these shoes that um, is very consistent in my work. And then, but anyways, in this piece, um, her, she's, the girl's looking into this hole right over here. And her face is actually lustered silver. So you can see the reflection of the base and kind of the hole in her shoes um, on, on her face. And I came across this quote from Alice in Wonderland, um, but I nearly forgot, you must close your eyes, otherwise you won't see anything. And it really um, spoke to me and kind of gave me more of an idea of why I don't do eyes. Um, I think in a way, like, the lack of eyes is representative of like the blind trust that we have as children. In addition to like the um, 
obliviousness to the world that we have as children when we find something that we're really like interested in and fixated on and like obsessed with like it all goes back to that kind of thinking in in kids um and so this girl finds a hole and is just staring at it um but the luster in her face almost like makes you question like why is this hole like so important like is she finding herself or seeing herself in the hole um is um it like giving her like an answer to something giving her some kind of mean like life meaning um so yeah it, this piece was a very kind of um like self-finding reflective piece for me um it in the end like kind of brought together all these ideas with the Tang Dynasty ladies the um childhood all the childhood themes that I was going off of from my bachelor show um kind of like really grounded itself in this piece and then I also hooked the red a little one step further and it was with this piece that I started to consistently draw flowers on the girl's underwear whenever I could. And like whenever I would make them wear white dresses to kind of go off of the whole purity thing. And I think the red in a way, um, on, on the underwear in particular, like it brings back that adult eye into the into the piece which is so kind of made up of just childish behavior like this girl's just stuck on a hole like to us as adults like there's no kind of no reason or like explanation for her to be so interested in this hole but as kids like we just find things that we like even if they could be just sticks or like holes or um scratches on the wall or something like that but the adult eye going into this, she's in this kind of like vulnerable state now because like she's minding her own business and like looking um, in, at something that she likes. But we, as the viewer, we can actually see up her dress and um, kind of have this, I wouldn't say like, hmm, almost like tainted view of her because then people nowadays like might say um like the whole idea of like feminism and um like rape culture like girls um kind of like ask for it or like they were um wearing this outfit so it was like suggested that they want things to be done to them but it's it's like wrong that we have this kind of like perspective that we put on things and so like that whole idea um was like kind of added onto the whole meaning of me sticking with using girls um and like keeping color simple now to like red and white um and then this piece wildflower um, was kind of an exploration to the different faces that we have when we're children and women and um, just like people in general, I think, um, to, to an outsider, like this person, she's just a little girl. She is innocent. She can't do much harm. Um, but she really, she's holding this red crayon and kind of like scribbling everywhere and like has the red, she colored the flower red. So like everything's like bleeding out and like kind of melting and like bleeding onto all of the white in her outfit. And she has this kind of like scary mask on. So I just wanted to show like how now the red is almost like symbolic of adulthood, whereas it like 
taints over childhood and like forces then all these um, rules and regulations and um, mm, kind of like things that we see as um, like un unnecessary unnecessarily uh, wrong about things that we do. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of show that. Um, and another piece I kind of explored that whole idea was Flowers for You, where it was really about being vulnerable. Um, this girl is completely like naked besides like this, her socks and underwear. And the way that I like painted her, it almost looks like she's like bleeding um, and like abused looking, but she's still like offering you these flowers kind of like making peace and stuff um but but the flowers are kind of like dying a lot of them have their petals off so it's this almost like saying goodbye to childhood like as time goes on um this offering that um lets us know that childhood is fleeting like flowers it, it doesn't it doesn't last. Um, kind of getting a little, a little dark. Um, it's kind of going away from more of the happier pieces. Um, but I think there is a lot of heavier meaning, like children aren't always happy. Um, they do see a lot of things despite all of these figures not having eyes or like and a lot of the times the things that they see, like we as adults end up not seeing. So as time goes on, like there's, an, there's this view of like, who's really like blind? Are we all blind together? Or like, do we see everything? Do we, but just choose not to say or do anything about it? It's this whole idea that um, I'm starting to become interested in. Um, and then a large piece that I wanted to make at that time that kind of also conveyed this vulnerability and like fleetingness of childhood came, happened because of this photo. I had came across this photo, I think on Instagram, it was taken by one of the photographers that I follow of his daughter and I thought that it was just a perfect, um, the perfect photo to link with um, the pieces that I, I had been making. Um, she's totally in her own little planet right now because she's like airing herself out. It's hot. She doesn't care that people can see her in just her underwear. She's lifted her shirt up but she's just happy. She's in her own little world. Whereas like as adults, like we would never do that. Yeah. Um, so I had started compiling a bunch of photos that I thought um, really spoke to me that had similar uh, qualities to that. Um, I found this picture of also this kid in a cardboard box. And I thought that it's nothing to do with each other, but I'm gonna combine the two images together. And what came out of it was this piece, Blow. And I just wanted to talk about almost like it being the end of summer, synonymous with like the end of childhood and just vulnerability in general. Um, and how trusting this kid is to like, it's their environment and everything um, without like a care for what's going on around them. Um, here's some more details. Um, I also glazed this one similar to the flowers for you piece where it almost looks like 
she's like abused, bleeding, kind of. Um, I think one, it's visually like I, I like the the melting, the rosiness of the knees and like in her hands and her toes. Um, but yeah, adding that red was another layer of just kind of like adulthood and time like passing by and slowly like taking over this white pure child. And I also have the flowers um, on her underwear as well. Um, and then after the series, I came across this video um, that in inspired a whole new um, series that I got into. Um, I was always interested in, in superheroes and the idea of like good and bad. So applying that to like the childhood heroes and like what they, what many of the cartoons for children about superheroes kind of like um, the message that they tell about like dreams and always believing and um, having like faith in the good really spoke to me. So this video is an interview that happened in 2015 after the Paris terrorist bombs went off and in it um the reporter is asking this little boy like how he's feeling and like if he's scared and it's just this the the answer that he gives and the way that his father consoles him um just really stuck to, stuck with me and it still sticks with me to this day like um the piece that's currently in the show um there's some references to this video too I'll play it. just a short clip and finally tonight here how do you explain what happened here in paris to a child this week we've met so many families here who brought their young children out to light the candles but this tribute this father says is still not enough it's not enough to understand but how do you explain to a child <laughs> the bad guys will not win Listen to this interview from Le Petit Journal with a father and son who live here in France. The young boy, nervous after the attacks. Il faut faire vraiment attention parce qu'il faut il faut changer de maison. Non, t'inquiète pas. On n'a pas besoin de changer de maison. C'est la France notre maison. Mais il y a des méchants papa. Oui, mais il y a des méchants partout. Il y a des méchants partout. Ils ont les pistolets, ils peuvent nous tirer dessus parce qu'ils sont très très méchants papa. C'est pas grave, ils ont des pistolets, nous on a des fleurs. Bah, les fleurs, ça fait rien, c'est pour. C'est pour. C'est pour. Euh... Si, regarde, tu vois, tout le monde pose. Oui. C'est pour combattre les pistolets. C'est pour. C'est pour protéger. Voilà. Et les bougies aussi. C'est pour ne pas oublier les gens qui, se, qui sont partis. Hein. Euh... C'est pour nous protéger <rire> les fleurs et les bougies. Ça va mieux du coup? Oui, ça va mieux. Perfect. Yeah, so to this day, like that whole conversation really still like lingers like in the back thoughts of my mind when I like think of new pieces. Um and how <laughs> now I think there's this new meaning of flowers in my work that um I want there to be. And it's not just like the flowers are um, there as like decoration and then like the red kind of like always taints them because the rest of the piece is white and stuff. I think now um, the flowers are almost this peace offering and this protection to the figures and like whatever else is like in the piece um so you can see that change coming up um and then i just wanted to also share some of the other images i looked at at the same time that i was thinking of like superheroes um guns versus flowers um good versus bad 
this big like duality um I grew up watching a lot of Sailor Moon and um a lot of Ultraman um who are both like justice fighters um Sailor Moon speaks more to like um girls and like having dreams and um believing yourself um whereas Ultraman is just this alien it's almost like Superman this alien that comes to earth just to battle all of the the wrongdoers in the world and then this um Japanese comic in the middle um also at the time really stuck out to me when I found it it's called I am a hero and it talks about this guy that um is I think he was a comic book artist and he was very he had low self-esteem um very quiet introverted person but when it came time to like save everyone he was able to like do it with like no second thought um and he became the protagonist to to his story which I thought was really really inspiring um and I also started doing a bunch of drawings too. And I thought this one was fitting to share at this time. Um, you can see this figure right here ha is what the giraffe bird um, evolved into. Less giraffe, um, less bird too. I don't really know what it is now. It's just a four-legged humanoid creature. Um, but yeah, just the, the imagery of flowers really, really like blossomed um, at this time. Like I was putting it on everything. Um, and because just the whole idea that flowers just make everything better. Like people have gardens to make themselves feel better. People go to um, see flowers and buy flowers to either offer them to people to make them feel better or make themselves feel better. Um, and I really like the idea of that. So this was the main series that was inspired by the video. It's called Flower Heroes. And it's comprised of these four main characters. Um, first one that I made was Godzilla Girl. Um, and the whole idea of using Godzilla was that I never really saw Godzilla as the true like antagonist to the story. Um, a lot of the times in the end that Godzilla actually like helps the helps the people like fight against the other like bad kaiju or creatures. Um, and so I thought that Godzilla was like a good symbol for like this balance. Like it's, yes, he's destructive, but there's also this uh, like heroic side of him. And so I made her wear um, this kind of Godzilla mask and kind of went back to the car really cartoonish um, era of my, my work. And then just made him hold a bouquet of flowers as if he's like offering himself to you for peace. Um, and then the next piece is titled Flower Power. And this one went back to the 60s and was looking at like pictures of like hippies and the time of... Um, war um and how they just believed it was not the right thing and things could be solved just through the power of flowers and like love um it's very idealistic but that whole message is just so so strong and powerful and i think um yeah if if these heroes did exist like they could they would actually fight bad through just flowers like it'd be that's that that's how powerful I think the flowers are um and yeah and so this guy's holding a gun but instead of bullets of course just bouquets of flowers pop out <clears throat> 
and then the next one handgun similar idea um but a little bit more personal um she's dressed like all in this like floral clad outfit she has this helmet on with like cutesy little things drawn on it and just from her her handgun um she's shooting out a single flower um for the bad guys at the same time like these poses and like ideas I got a lot from like pictures of children and pictures of like Power Rangers and just like illustrations of different crazy poses I was really into um because a lot of the times I think most of my work were very like stagnant they were just standing there so I wanted to like change it up a bit with um, some movement. Um, and then this piece here is titled, Everything is Going to Be All Right, I Am a Hero, which is another quote um, from that Japanese comic, I Am a Hero. I think it's one of the first things he says when he saves the first person, the first when he saves the first person that he saves. Um, and it's very reassuring. Um, I like the line a lot. So I actually had the line, the quote um, saved in one of my sketchbooks and then kind of made a piece for it because I knew that this quote was gonna be a part of the series. Um, yeah, and this piece in particular also references um, like Sailor Moon and stuff with um, the red kind of like skirt around her and the bright red boots. Um, and then end of the series, but still on the whole idea of heroes. Uh, this was the next piece that I made um, titled The Hero Always Arrives Late, which is ironic because the previous piece was titled Everything is Going to Be All Right, I Am a Hero. Um, little did they know that some heroes arrive late. And in this case, this hero arrives late because they got stuck in um, a group of happy things <laughs> like flowers and candy. Um, I didn't include a close up of the other side, but there's like toys like teddy bears also stuck in this group and there's glitter um, and everything's just supposed to be like calming and like almost like a melted cotton candy kind of feel. Um, so just the idea that yes there are heroes in the world um but sadly like they can't always save um who they need to save in time um yeah um and then i included some of these pieces um not because they had anything to do with heroes or um the kind of like themes that I was interested in at the time, but more of like visually, they had a bunch of um, ideas that I played with in my head a lot. So I got into this show called Heads Up. And so I had made a bunch of heads and like sculptures of heads and like drawings of heads um, as ways to like come up with ideas. And this one called Flower Head and I played with, um, the idea of, this is actually, I think, one of the only like boy characters that I've made um, just based off of hair. Um, and he also has closed eyes. I didn't include a, a picture of it, but like if you look at the piece, his eyes are closed and these open eyes are actually painted on him. So his expression is very like somber. He does, he's not smiling at all. Um, and he just has this like horrific face painted on him. But at the same time, he has the, these um, very cartoony, fun like flowers growing out of his head. Um, and it was just a, a fun little juxtaposition piece that I had made. I don't think there's a real meaning to this one though. Um, and then also next to it, this head vase that I made um, going back to uh, the Tong Dynasty ladies and like the hairstyles that they had. Um, I wanted to make something that kind of um, played played around with that. And there was another detail about the ladies 
um, that were usually depicted in paintings that they all wore flowers in their heads to kind of uh, make them more beautiful, um, but also remind them that like beauty was fleeting too. Um, and I think this is one of the only blonde people that I've made. I don't think it was just like, she's a blonde, but um, I think I just needed the color balance with all the yellow that I put in. I thought yellow would look good on her hair too. Um, and then these are some drawings that I did. Um, it's funny because whenever I draw, most of the times I do put eyes in my pieces. Um, I'm not really sure why though, um, except for the just like a feeling that I have when I sculpt that they're like more like real beings in the world that should have that extra layer of like meaning. So I don't give them eyes. Um, I, I love drawing eyes. I think they're creepy. Um, yeah, so these were just some strange little drawings that I did. Um, and two more pieces that I made for this head series. Um, Sticker face really was just an embodiment of like childish behaviors. Um, I've looked at a lot of photos of kids and adults like completely covered head to toe in stickers. And I thought it would be fun to um, try to see if I can recreate that in ceramic. So I just made like really, really um, thin slabs that I cut different shapes out and then I painted them and then lustered the edges. So it looked silver like stickers. Um, and I thought it would be interesting that I added sticker eyes on this piece as opposed to like making eyes or like, it was just a different way of like covering up the eyes. Um, and fish eyes also, a different way of covering the eyes. Um, moving on from giraffe bird to duck, um, now interested in fish. So whenever I had the chance and it was like suitable, I would add fish or like draw fish. Um, and I think the fact that like these are dead fish heads, um, it also added this layer of vulnerability like that they were like killed, but people like in, in uh, wet markets or not even wet markets, just like supermarkets in general, when the fish heads are still intact, um, they just have them on display and they, it's kind of sad, sad looking. Um, yeah. And then the last head that I made um, is this one titled All I Want is World Peace. And the title actually came later. I had made the piece and then it wasn't, I think, until maybe like a few months later that I came up with the title. And the whole process of this head in particular um, it started off with just me wanting to um, make some peace signs. Um, being like Asian, um, and I don't think it's synonymous to Asian, but like Asianness, but we are seen posing with peace signs a lot. Um, and I thought that it'd be really interesting to put them on the eyes. Um, because they do, they do mean peace. So like this person, um, just has the desire for peace in their eyes, but their hands are also kind of like cut off at the wrist. Um, you can see what looks like to be like veins or arteries or very like goriness, like hanging out of their hands, um, but are then also covered with flowers. So it's like, it's okay. Um, it's like growing back. There's still life in them. <laughs> and um, yeah, like looking at, looking back at this piece now, which was also a piece that I looked at before I made the, the work that I have in the current show. Um, 
I think this was one of the big um, inspirations again and like influences to like the whole idea that I was going for in the the show. And I think it also is quite um, current, um, especially with what has been going on starting or like m- not starting in 2020, but more evident starting in 2020 that um, there's like a lot of hate for Asian Americans that have like been um, depicted in the news or like uh, covered and stuff. Um, the percentage of like hate crimes for Asian Americans has gone up. And so I thought it was very fitting um, as a transition um, piece to move on into the work that I made for the show. Um, So the whole installation is called Along the Flower Road. And this piece is a real culmination of everything that I've talked about during this talk, like the whole journey from what I had, what I was interested in college, what I had picked up along during my residency at Northern Clay Center, the years after my residency, um, and up until now, like all the issues and like themes are all like thrown into this piece. Um, there, in the background, there's a lot of violence. Um, there's like a gunfight here. There's Godzilla, because I still like Godzilla a lot and incorporating him whenever I can. And then there's these like little demonic children. I'll have close-ups and um, next slides. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to have that whole juxtaposition between children seeing things and like, um, but not being aware of their surroundings. They don't know the, like, the bigger things that are going out there in the world. They're on like one side of the wall, whereas um, all of the bad stuff is on the other side of the wall. And like everything that we shelter them from is on the other side of the wall. Um, the hairstyles um, that I now focus on for these girls are all like bowl cut with bangs. Um, and I think they look a lot like helmets and stuff. It's always like the saying when like the hair is like a girl's, like one of the girls like weapons or something um, that they can fight against because it like protects them and makes us comfortable and confident. Um, and I think this idea applies to these girls too, um, that these hairs are very much like helmets for them that like block their vision um but also like kind of enables them to see like what is important to them and what is not um and yeah being everything that has happened in 2020 I thought I would make this piece that um really kind of showed the divide um not just um linking it to like childhood and like adulthood and like that shift that happens when um, we stop being sheltered. But like, even as adults, like, I think that you can say that these might not be children at all. They might just be like um, adult female figures walking down this road. Um, But as adults, like it's the same thing I feel like that happens. that we see certain things, that we pay attention to certain things. Um, There's a lot of like like misinterpretation, but also a lack of um, care for things that happen that aren't directly involved with us that we can kind of like block off. Like, a lot of the times when I watch the news, um, there's some things on the news that I question, like, why is this relevant to us when there's so many other things that we could be watching <laughs> about, could be on the news, like, especially on a world news channel, like, um, yeah, 
and it's just things that we deem as important versus things that we deem as not. Um, and so this whole piece was an exploration of that. Um, so as I started sketching out what I wanted this piece to look like, um, I, I looked at a lot of images of um, houses and neighborhoods in my favorite like comics and like animations. Um, this house in particular is a very famous um, house in Japanese animation. Um, this character right here, um, his name is Doraemon. He lives there with his family and this guy's a futuristic cat um, that has this magical pouch on his stomach that whatever, <laughs> excuse me, whatever kind of tool you need um, for any occasion, he'll just like grab it out of his pouch or like he'll have it. Um, but just the whole idea that all these houses um, and neighborhoods have these giant walls that protect them. And like the same time, like um, throughout a whole like Trump's um, presidency, he always talked about building a wall to protect us from like Mexico and stuff. So like the wall was very important. Like it was the first part of this project that I knew was gonna be there. It, the question was whether it was going to be a wall or a fence, which is more, um, I think, Americana, the whole idea of the picket fence, it's like going around your house, a white picket fence um, to symbolize like um, you have like the perfect life, but like what's beyond that fence. So I was really trying to figure out which visual um, that I, I wanted to portray in, in the final piece. And I think in the end, I picked the wall just because it was more effective. Um, there's no gaps, like it's very, very much separate. Um, yeah. Um, and then the figures themselves were inspired um, through this girl in particular, her name is May. She's from um, a Japanese animation called My Neighbor Totoro. Um, and it's just her poses that I was really interested in. Um, in the opening of the, the movie, they have this, um, her walking down in the middle of the road with like all these different creatures. There's um, this cat bus, it's 12 legged cat bus. There are these um, like dust spirits and stuff. And the big creature that's known as Totoro, which looks like a giant um, like uh, magical raccoon like cat thing. Um, but anyways. So I was just really interested in the many poses that she had. <laughs> I thought they were fitting um, for the different girls I wanted to be a part of in this piece. So I took the one from her walking and I placed it in the first piece, which is, um, I think the same, it's titled The Stroll. So like, which is also the opening song of the movie, it's also called Stroll. And I thought, I looked up the, I translated the lyrics and it was very, very like happy-go-lucky. It says, hey, let's go, hey, let's go. I'm happy as can be, let's go walking, you and me. And the whole idea of that, um, I thought it was fitting because there are some people that are just happy-go-lucky. It's the child that, um, or adult that walks through life, um, doesn't really, have any bothers like they just kind of not, not necessarily ignore everything but um they just believe that they don't have to have those worries like they're they can be happy like going on with dealing with whatever they have like in front of them and then um I was still unsure of what the middle figure was going to be but I knew the last figure um I knew she she had to have her back against the um the first figure who was walking forward 
and I thought it would be a nice um, uh, like comparison, um, depending on like meaning, whatever I was trying to have her say. I didn't know it at the time yet. Um, but yeah, she, the first one, the stroll, I ended up making her walk forward with a whole bunch of um, upright bright red flowers to kind of symbolize like the the child as well as um, the flower now being synonymous with the child too. So like, and like the whole idea of a child, very um, playful, very straightforward. Um, and just in their own world, happy, but still um, covered in red because it is like walking in this like adult, adult path. And then the, the last one, the last piece with her back against everyone else, I decided to make her squatting down and poking these almost like drooping dying flowers and I thought the idea that um of her flowers being dying was was like relevant to the whole piece was because like in my mind her interest and her like fixation on what's in front of her, um, even though it's something important, like these dying flowers, like she still like is lost in her own world. Like she has, she doesn't know that these creatures are like spying on her. Um, and it might be that they're, um, that there's something very important like that she's um, concentrating on and that that's like life. So there might be things that are happening and very awful things, but ourselves like in front of us, we already have these major problems that we have to deal with. And in most cases, like it's hard to deal with both problems. Um, so you gotta do with them one at a time. She has to deal with these flowers that are dying first. And then um, I finally figured out the piece that was going in the middle and I decided to make um, two figures. I think this is the first time that I ever made two interacting figures in one piece. Um, and it was, it was fun, like um, trying to like come up with the meaning of the second figure. Um, in a way, I think, the one on top covering the bottom person's eyes is is the adult figure that like of her future or um that's like just protecting her um sheltering her still in addition to the wall like from everything that's bad um but she's so high up the one that's above that she's able to like really see over the wall. And so she sees all these horrific things that are going on. Um, and it's just like bleeding down like all over her. And like the, it's like a hit of like reality or something that like kind of washes over her entire self. Um, and the title is maybe it's just me, but isn't the view beautiful even when you can't see it? And like, in my mind, I know that she, the one on top can see everything that's going on, but like in a way she also still can't, she can't see because like visually like her hair covers her eyes. So like just playing with these two, two meanings of like sight and um, what's really going on in this piece. Um, I also had a hard time with this piece. Like, did I want 
originally I wanted her to be facing the wall. So like we couldn't see um, their faces at all unless you bent down and like looked over the, um, over their shoulders to like peer at their faces. Cause I thought it would, it would be more powerful. It would have, um, it would give you a better sense of the meaning that I was going for because then she'd actually be looking over the wall. But I think in the end I chose to have her like face us was so that she could face us. So like, yes, there's like horrible things happening behind her, but she's also like looking into our world, um, which is where all like the real stuff happens, like all the real horrible stuff happens. So I thought that was fitting too. And then you can also see her face without you having to um, look around. Um, and I also wanted to do a little sneak peek of her underwear, of course, in all the pieces, they all have floral underwear. Um, just another another thing to carry forward. Um, and finally, just wanted to go over the, the painting, <coughs> excuse me, that's titled Along the Flower Road. Um, <clears throat> so this piece, um, it's, this is the first time I ever did anything like this, um, to have the, some kind of 2D artwork paired with my sculptures. And it was really exciting to get this opportunity to do this. Um, I thought that it really was a chance to let the viewer look into my world because it's hard to do that just with like, 3D objects, even if they're life-size, um, you're walking through them in the gallery, um, just like a painting or a drawing can offer so much more like um, visual information um, that I was really able to share this world that they live in with, with everyone. Um, and it's always been, um, it's, it's kind of sad. This has always been the kind of world that they lived in. It, I say that it was inspired by 2020 and like the whole like divided nation and like everything bad that was going on. But um, it's from the beginning, it's been like kind of the message that I was going for where children are sheltered, they live in their own bubble. Um, and it's not only until adulthood that they realize certain things realize that there's um, rules and um, people criticize certain behaviors or like activities or um, things that they do are interested in um, just because that's social norm. Um, and, and so like these figures, they've always been like hiding in this world where they're on one side of the wall where they're sheltered, but the violence and the crazies have always been on the other side. And so it was nice to get this chance to show visually though, like how I envisioned um, the crazy stuff on the other side of the wall. Um, and just have these close-ups of the gunfight. Um, one of them, they, that's the flower hero fighting with the flower. Um, who won? I have no idea. Um, hopefully it's the flower hero. Um, and this guy right here, just uh, showing his true um, opinions to the world. Um, and these demon children, um, just always spying and like kind of lurking around, um, causing like temptations and um, trying to catch you doing things that maybe you shouldn't be. Um, they're like trying to like drag you to their side of the wall. They're always there. Um, and then I put just flat fire. Fires all over the piece because it's kind of a synonymous um, thing with destruction, death, um, evil, but also I think it's a symbol of rebirth too, like the Phoenix. Um, so maybe 
that other side is healing. And I also figured that I'd put the the flowers on the wall too, but this time they're they're on these bushes that are directly behind the wall. So it's the wall, then the bushes, and like everything else is behind them. And it's almost like these bushes with the flowers were grown there um, as a means to be a second layer of protection in addition to the wall. Like that little boy said in the in the video, like the flowers are meant to protect and um, they are a peace offering. They make people feel better. So they kind of like color that world a little bit more cheerfully than what it might seem, when it might not seem what it actually is. It just has this um, whole happy feel to it. Um, and it was also uh, the choice of color. I wanted it to be very pastel, very um, uh, pleasing to the eye to look at until you kind of get closer and you're like, oh, that's what's really going on there. Um, which is how kind of we look at the world. We always go, oh, well, that's actually what's happening right now. Um, but yeah, so that's my whole, my whole journey um, to how I got to where I am now. Um, definitely more interested in, or had been interested in incorporating not only stories from other people that I have, but now I've, I've been incorporating just more like current news and like um, really sculpting to kind of explore my feelings and response to things that happen in the world. Um, there's like little that I think I can really do to like help make everything better. So I think now that that's one of the reasons why I make it's just so to to get my um, views and um, source of like flower offerings out there in the world. Um, yeah, so are there any questions? I have a question. Hold on. I'm trying to um, see everyone. I have to, I think I have to stop sharing. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. So who had a question? Oh, I do. Hi. Oh, Steph. Hi. <laughs> hey, Val. I, um, well, I just wanted to say that I love how um, these aesthetic choices that you're making and kind of these things that you started out with, like no eyes and flowers that you continued to incorporate into your work and continue to make um, as, as you went kind of, and as they were contextual, contextualized in the world, kind of gained these meanings or revealed these meanings to you. Um, especially um, kind of how your work confronts uh, the viewer or the audience with how, how they project thoughts onto girls or how society has conditioned them to project thoughts onto girls. But I, I wanted to ask if there was any kind of in your work now emerging symbols or imagery that you really find yourself um, pulled towards that you haven't maybe found the meaning or the, the, um, the you know, maybe why you're doing it yet? Hmm. That's a very good question, Steph. Thank you. <laughs> um, huh. Uh, I think there probably is. I just can't think of it right now. So I... I think I've just been with this piece. I was so fixated, kind of like the the figures in my own pieces on like what I had to work with. Um, um, it's always just been such a focus on keeping it simple now, especially after. I mean, I do enjoy my pieces from my um, my my back BFA show, 
but looking back at the pieces now they're very they're so over the top and just like filled with these random things I know I was going for more like absurdity and stuff in children's stories and like how I gathered stories and kind of collaged it all together um but recently I think I've just been keeping it simple it's it's just been flowers and girls um and that's really it though conversation with my sister um recently as I was trying to prepare for this she um mentioned that I have this fascination with blobs um in my work too um wasn't a lot of blobs in the pictures that I um decided to put in the slideshow but I think if you guys recall there was a giant blob in um the the giraffe bird, the giraffe bird was sitting on a giant blob that was emerging from these like chimney towers. Um, and then the stuff in the jelly beans ones, which is that stuff right there in the talk right now. That's, <laughs> that's her with jelly beans. Sorry, Steph, to call you out on that. Um, but she was sitting on like a blob like gum thing too, it's a bright, bright pink. And um, I can actually show you guys next to me. I have this piece um, where it's this guy sitting on almost like a like a table like thing and with a duck, of course. Um, but there's another blob spouting out of its head. Um, and I don't um, I don't know how I can like add that into my work now. I haven't found uh, a need to yet to incorporate it into um my current pieces but um I did have a commission that I made I, I took recently and it was to actually be I do a lot of like um lifelike commissions so like they'll give me photos of a friend family whatever and then um I'll take that idea in the photo and then like combine it with whatever I want to make. And so this request was actually of a hunter. Um, and I felt kind of conflicted taking it because I'm not really pro hunting. Um, and in the photo, it was um, of him holding his rifle in front of um, a deer that he just shot. And it was so sad to just see but I thought like by taking this commission that I would maybe be able to push it in a different way that doesn't um glorify like the hunting itself so <laughs> excuse me um I actually made the deer this time like lie on a blob um that was supporting its head and it had flowers growing all over it and the base was about um maybe like four inches wide. Um, and so like the figure just kneeling on the base was like most of it. There wasn't a lot of room to make the full deer's body. And so I sculpted the front half of it. And then with the remaining space on the dome base, I turned the rest of the deer into another blob with flowers growing on it. And I thought it was like a reminder of um, how creatures and humans, like we die, um, be it our uh, naturally or like our life got taken from us like um, due to an un untimely manner, but um, it's natural and it's like a cycle and the steer died, but then the flowers are like a rebirth and like the body goes back into nature and into the blob of things um so it made me feel a little bit better as I like made it um but yeah there there's a blob and I think that if I get um any um, a chance to like make large things again I think I'll really like incorporate it more into um the figures and have them maybe interact um with them more yeah I don't know if that really answered your question stuff but I tried. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Val. And um, excited to see more blobs. Everything was beautiful. And 
very honored to be Jelly Bean Girl. Yeah. <laughs> Val, we have a question in the chat um, from Al. Uh, a bit of a technical question. Okay. I'm curious about the scale of Steph and her jelly beans and um, if oh. those if all the pieces were ceramic and if they were fired together and Al says they're so in love with your sculpting. Oh, thank you so much, Al. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Steph and the jelly beans in the photo, um, it was on um, a base. It had, it was on a wheelie cart and then it had one cinder blocks worth of height added to the cart. And so taking that away from the piece itself, like the rest of it was probably, um, I'd say probably like four feet tall. Um, so all together, it was quite a tall piece. Like it was standing up, it was eye level with me. Maybe it was like three and a half feet tall. And then standing up was like four to five feet tall. Um, but yeah, that thing, was everything built? Yes, everything was ceramic, except for the cart and the base, of course. Um, but I built that one in sections because I knew how, how heavy the end result would be. So the duck's body was one piece. The duck's head was one piece that sat into the body. And then the blob was one piece that sat into the duck. And then the legs of the girl was a piece that sat onto the blob. Her upper torso was another piece. And then finally, um, her head. So it was quite a number of pieces, but it just made um, transportation, like moving things myself so much easier. Um, and a lot of those larger pieces that I showed you guys were done like that. So even the giraffe bird, like um, the figure that sat on the base was able to be taken out, her head to be popped off. Um, and then the upper part of the giraffe bird could be taken out. So like. I could just move everything myself. Um, but yeah, if, if I had a chance to work with um, a different material, like if I made the jelly beans glass, I think that would have been really interesting. Um, but yeah, future, future endeavors. Um, I do do a lot of like cold surfacing. So not everything in that piece and my pieces are glazed. I use a lot of nail polish. <laughs> um, I use a lot of just like um, gouache paints with sealants on it. Um, mm, a lot of like epoxy putty to make really like, I, I don't, this is probably a minor detail that you, you guys didn't notice, but on the lollipop piece, her um, tassels that pulled on her sweater, they were really skinny. And at first I was going to make them out of just clay, but it, um, it wouldn't have worked because the way I built the piece in sections, her head was able to be taken out of. So then the, the tasks would be like floating over her just of how things were attached. So they would break easily. So I ended up making them removable and um, they were made out of epoxy putties just so it was a little bit um, of a sturdier material. Yeah. Thank you for your question. And there's actually a quick follow up to that Al asked um, about the scale of the very last piece. So the one that's in the Secret Life of Objects exhibition. Ah. Yeah, so in that one, I, the tallest piece is I think around 19 inches tall. And that's the girl in the middle, the one with the double figure. Everything else, um, I think the stroll, the girl that's walking forward, her height is around 16 inches by maybe like 10 inches wide. Um, and then the girl poking the flower um, is probably the same size as the stroll, but like horizontally. So like 16 or so inches lengthwise, and then maybe like eight to 10 inches tall. So it's a fairly small piece. Um, but I thought it was fitting just so everything's like almost not like a dollhouse scale, but like everything was just like tiny enough that you're actually like peering into their world. Um, yeah, like we're giants like looking into their world. 
something like that. And the painting I think was like 60 inches long. So, and then divide that by three. So like, it was like a triptych with a painting section behind like each piece um, to about like 25 inches high, some dimensions like that. Hey Val, uh, I have a question. Okay. So um, I just wanna say having never really asked you why you make your sculptures <laughs> girls, why you put flowers and uh -huh. the way you paint them and stuff. Um, kind of what I thought was like, you know, you're trying to show innocence of childhood and then also like, you know, the adult world is exactly what you explained today, which is awesome. Um, but my question was more about the rosy cheeks. Originally, I was going to ask you why you paint such like huge circles ah. of rosy cheeks. And you kind of explained it, right, that you were inspired by the East Asian art. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm stuff but I was wondering why do you let it's not in all of your um sculptures but some of them you yeah, let kind of like bleed the paint, and... yeah you kind of let it bleed is there a reason you do that or you just did it once and it looked nice you're like okay, um, let me that's probably how it started but like Steph said meaning finds its way into things um and I was actually talking to Zoe um who's also in this chat about that um and I had come up with this answer where if I were to like really assign it meaning, it would be as if they were the, the method of painting it in the layers that I add the color. It's like the childhood to adulthood. So I always start with a light pink and then I kind of spray it and let it like melt down a little. So like that really really like pinky like happy color um is what I identify as a child like pink's my favorite color like like I love that that um hue of it um and then I after the pink wash I always then add um like like white either like white dots or like I'll blob in some white and let it bleed into the color a little and like melt and then kind of repeat that until I get a the the base quality that I want um, and I think the white going onto the pink, it's representative of like the, again, like the purity, the color white, um, and the innocence of children, just adding on to that. And then the last thing is the red. And it's like the flowers. I don't really let the red, m they bleed down, but they don't mix into the other colors that much. It's always like pops of it that appear. I don't want it to look like acne, but sometimes that's what it ends up looking like. It just looks like they have like acne on their cheeks. Um, that works. It's yeah. Going from a right, right. But yeah, that's very literal then the puberty, like going from yeah. child to adulthood. But yeah, I think if I were to assign it meaning, um, that that would be it. Though in real in reality, it's uh, it's just because I like I like how it looks. Um, <laughs> that's what I figured yeah <laughs> that's cool though that it works with your overall theme mm -hmm. all right we've got uh quite another question in the chat and I think for the sake of time we'll have this be the last yes. one um all right so from Jill in the chat asking about future plans are you looking at other residencies or grad school once once it's more possible yeah I, I definitely am interested in um, doing more residencies because like now um, going back home, I haven't had access to like a large kiln in quite some time. And I just have all these ideas that I want to make like really like big pieces or like have really elaborate installations where it, it is the focal point of the whole room, either like being maybe I fill the entire room with like figures or I always I always had this idea of like making a field of flowers um and like maybe like a soul child like in the middle some, something like that um so I think either going to a residency like uh, yeah going to a residency would like make that possible grad school I'm still unsure of um 
Yeah, I think maybe, maybe like sometime in the future, I'll have the desire to like really like go back to school and um, kind of like like confirm my degree in art with with the masters. Um, but r- like right now, still I I haven't had that desire. Um, yeah, and I know that it's not, it doesn't have to be like a, just a desire. That can also be a way for me to be, start to make the big pieces again. Um, but I, yeah, yeah, Jill, I, I just really, I, I don't know. I need to think more about it. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Val. And I'm sure I thank say that you so much, everyone here for your time and um, sharing your world with us and immersing us in the in this very intriguing and imaginative place. So um, thank you. And thank you all who attended. And I posted the link to the Secret Life of Objects um, tour in the chat if you want to take a look at it and that last piece that Valerie shared about is featured in the exhibition so you can zoom in on it up close too um, and we, we're getting just lovely messages of thanks in the chat too so um, thanks again Valerie and uh, everyone else for coming have a good night thank you everyone for attending and thank you everyone at Northern Clay for allowing me to to share all this with you guys. You're the best.